Nowadays, it's easy for someone to forget their place in the many parts of the web of life. But one faithful reminder appears out of the blue, a catalyst to the idea that all parts, no matter how small, have their own place in the bosom of Mother Nature. If ever there were a more faithful reminder than the honeybee. Hi, my name is Justin Ben. I moved to Relay 16 years ago before I can even remember. Perhaps the most famous part about Relay is the Thomas Viaduct, the first multi-span masonry railroad bridge in the United States to be built on a curve. But another interesting part, a gem that sits in the middle of Relay, is Mr. Sweet, the honey man. This box will be all honey when they're done with it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. The bee visits the flower, okay? Pulls nectar from the flower. And it will go to several flowers. That's how they collect the pollen from one flower to pollinate another bud to another plant. Okay, so it's dual purpose. They're not really out to get the honey so much as to pollinate the plants. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they go from one to another. Then when they get their abdomens, they have two, two stomachs. You've got a honey stomach and their normal stomach. So they're filling the honey stomach up. They'll take it back to the hive. They'll pass it to another house bee. They don't take it to the honeycomb themselves. Mm -hmm. They pass it to a house bee. That adds the enzymes to the honey. That gives it all the antibiotics and medicinal values of the honey. Then that house bee decides where to store it. Like going to the big warehouse and what shelf and locker they want to put that nectar into. So then that forager can go back to get more. That's how they stay productive. So the forager doesn't want to have to come to the hive, dump it, you know, and just wear itself out doing mm -hmm. that. It wants, they want to make three or four flights a day. And they'll fly up to five miles to get this nectar. So it's a long flight. And that's why bees in the summertime only live to be 35 days old. They just work themselves to death. Mm -hmm. They fly their wings off. That's, when a bee dies, they don't die in a hive normally. They fly, they die somewhere in the field. They just drop out of the sky or a bird gets them or, yep. you know, some mean kid steps on them, you know. But <laughs> it, you know, and that's the honey. The honey is then, once it's in a cell, is very watery, very liquid. You could shake it out. So it has to cure in the cell. And like I said earlier, it has to be 18%, 18.2% moisture content, which is water content. Mm -hmm to uh, be called honey. And once it is, and then they, they put a wax seal over that cell, a very thin wax seal. Now that's keeping any more air or moisture, like humid days and that sort of thing, from that honey, because the honey will absorb anything. It will absorb moisture, and that's why we don't use pesticides in the hive, at least I do not. It'll absorb any, anything that's in the hive, it'll absorb, but with that wax seal, it will not. So, when it's that way and it capped off and it got a nice whole frame of capped honey, that's when you can pull it out. Do you, you uncap it and spin it, and that's how you extract your honey. And That's my honey collection. And those are all the bears I've eaten over the course of this documentary. But my collection ain't got nothing on this guy. His name's Mr. Boyd. He has an apiary in West Virginia. And so the honeybee serves as a connection. Not just as a literal connection between us and the plants through the pollen and the process of the making of the honey, but as a bridge between us 
and the other more unnoticeable parts of nature. But if we continue on pretending like we don't see it, we'll soon lose that which we haven't yet truly appreciated.